Welcome to a new series here on the Wars of Rebellion channel, based on my book, The Civil War Battles of Macon. The War of the Rebellion has spun a vast number of myths in the southern states. Macon is no different from the rest of the region, and the events in July 1864, when a shell hit a house in Macon, created one of the most persistent stories in Macon lore. Today most Maconites know about quote unquote, the war of northern aggression and Sherman's quote unquote, atrocities because of the Cannonball House operated by the Sydney Lanier chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in the post-Second World War period, did the story of the Cannonball House become commonly known, turning the Asser Holt House into the Cannonball House. Let's untangle the myth. The story is often retold in the world of Hal Copps's wife, Mary Ann Lamar Cobb. In her letter to the, her mother on July 31st, she recounted the events. The language of Copps's letter is extremely convoluted and riddled with uncertainty. Considering Asserhold's wife found the unexploded shell in her house and that it must have remained around the structure, Mary Ann Lamar Cobb could not identify the shell correctly as a canonical Hotchkiss shell, calling it instead a ball. Similarly, did the shell rebound or ricochet? There was a significant amount of uncertainty in Cops's letter. From a military perspective, there are some issues worth considering too. Stoneman's artillery chief, Captain Hardy, had three-inch ordnance rifles at his disposal. These weapons had an effective range of about 1,800 to 2,000 yards at an elevation of about 5 degrees. If the cannon had an elevation of 16 degrees, the range could increase to as much as 4,100 yards. For the longest time, the Asser Holt has presented a small, round cannonball instead of the correct ordnance used by Captain Hardy, the canonical Hotchkiss shell. The distance from the Dunlarp Farm Hill, where the artillery battle was, and the Asser Hold House is about 3,170 yards, within the range of the high elevation, but not the typical 5 degree elevation. Operating at such a long range, the shot hitting the Asser Hold House was likely a dud. Let's turn to how this house has been remembered. The 1922 official automobile blue book devoted a small section to Macon and its tourist offering. The guide did not list the privately owned but historically important Hay or Holt House by 1940. Georgia, a guide to its towns and countryside, was similarly silent but devoted significantly more space to Macon and its history. Oddly, the guide did not mention the Stoneman or Kilpatrick raids. Similarly, a 1939 publication about Macon and its history continued to refer to the Asser Holt House, not the Cannonball House. Besides a brief celebration about the architecture and decoration, the booklet mentions the mended column and a dent in the floor of the hallway as evidence of the cannonball hitting the house. However, by the 1920s, 
the United Daughters of the Confederacy increasingly try to lay claim to the history of the rebellion and its stories in Macon that fostered the organization's racist and white supremacist agenda. A prominent member of the organization, Mary Calloway Jones, contributed a brief article regarding the Asser Holt House to the Macon Telegraph. Jones was part of the Sidley Lanier chapter in Macon. In the 1950s, a fellow member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy problematically called Jones the scholarly daughter of a distinguished Confederate family who followed in her father's footsteps as a careful and devoted writer of Southern history. Hardly an accurate description, considering the organization's history. In her article, Jones recounted the famous story of the cannonball hitting the house, then owned and occupied by Judge Usser Holt. She again told the story of the cannonball deflecting on the sandy sidewalk, hitting the second column from the left, passing through a window and through an upper corner of the front parlor into the hall. Importantly in her story, the house was the Usser Holt house, not the cannonball house. She reminded residents of the city of the story, refreshing their memory. In 1954, the Georgia Historical Commission placed a marker in the front of the house. The organization used the title Judge Asser Holt House, while the marker recounts the infamous cannonball narrative in appropriate but brief detail. It also notes the current resident at the time being a relative of the Holt family. However, nowhere does it say that the structure is a cannonball house or known as such. In commemoration of the centennial of the first Battle of Macon, the Macon Daily Telegraph ran an unassigned but clearly pro-Confederate story that started with 100 years ago today, the war between the states was in its fourth year and events were pointing towards an anguished April day at Appomattox when Macon felt the excitement of its first raid by federal forces. The article noted how General Stoneman's man had hastily entrenched near the Dunlop farm and fired upon the city. The author then incorrectly claimed that Macon had defensive earthworks that Confederate forces used to defend the city. Not true. Downplaying the damages by rebel artillery to the Dunlop farm, the author wrote, Legend has it that a Confederate shot went through the house, but no sign remains to substantiate that. Ironically, the shot was mentioned in the Macon News coverage of the battle. It seems odd that to make the Holt House story look stronger, one has to dismiss the story of another house getting hit. The article continued in its blend of fiction and reality by introducing then eight-year-old William Sims Payne, who supposedly recalled vividly the events of the day when he heard the shot go over his head. The author claimed that no one has put into print the account written many years later. The account, a treasured item held by the United Daughters of the Confederacy members, was supposedly written down in 1930, when Payne was 74 years old, and nine years before he died. The author notes how closely the account aligns with the events. However, his recollection did occur after Mary Calloway Jones reminded the community about the cannonball. We should be suspect. How reliable recollections 66 years later are of an event witnessed by an eight-year-old boy. After the centennial coverage, the new owners continued to struggle with raising sufficient funding to maintain the house. On April 12, 1965, Jane Brooks wrote a piece in the Macon Telegraph that indicated the United Daughters of the Confederacy were about to host an antique show to raise funds for the museum project. The group had started to change the language at this point. Instead of the Asser Holt House, people started to refer to the house as the Cannonball House. There was only one brief passing in reference to Judge Holt, the builder of the house. Even more, the United Daughters of the Confederacy continued to add to the mythology that surrounded the house. In a write-up for the UDC magazine, Margaret Duncan allowed her imagination to add to the well-known but sparsely documented story. Like in other modern pieces, Duncan only briefly mentioned Judge Usser Holt as a person who owns the house, but refers to the structure as a cannonball house. However, she dramatically changed the story, 
instead of the evidence presented about the house remaining known as the Holt House until the 1960s, Duncan claimed that the Holt home became known as the Old Cannonball after it was hit by a cannonball. Letting her imagination get the better of her even more, she added a new element to the well-known story. A small boy playing on the sand sidewalk nearby saw it hit the sidewalk first, based on Payne's recollection from the time. He could not have seen the shell hit the road in front of the house, nor does he claim so in his write-up. The Asserhold house suffered damage during Stoneman's raid on Macon. However, there is much mythology that surrounds the house today. When the United Daughters of the Confederacy purchased the property, they altered its name and quickly erased Asser Holt House from the local language and turned the house simply into the Cannonball House. As the story of the Asser Holt House became used by this neo-Confederate white supremacist organization, the Confederate shell hitting the Dunlop House disappeared from historic memory. And we can ask the question, why are we selectively remembering only one shell? Shouldn't we remember both?